bring me more. Here I come, Joe. I got some Prego spaghetti sauce. We can pour it right on top. Ah, uh, Just let me have my spaghetti while we watch the famous spaghetti western, the good, the bad, and the ugly, 1966. And it's gravy. Well. Don't talk. All right, today we're reviewing The Good, Bad, and the Ugly from 1966, the quintessential spaghetti western. Let me tell you about the plot, Joe. Let me tell our people about the plot. Oh, wah, 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 wah. Go, wah. Deb. Okay, you do the background of music while I read the plot. I'll be in Yonio Morricone. A bounty hunting scam set amidst the backdrop of the Civil War joins two men, Clint Eastwood and Eli Wallach, in an uneasy alliance against a man called Angel Eyes in a race to find a fortune in gold buried in a remote cemetery. That's the basic plot. I don't know where to start because, oh, the, I, because well, I'm ready to jump in. I love this film and I know we have to flip our scores later, but I, let's talk about the film. This was part of a trilogy kind of after the fact. Fistful of Dollars, a few dollars more, and then The Good, the Bad, the Ugly. While not originally thought of as a trilogy, Sergio Leone came up with this movie pretty much separate, but United Artists, you know, in, in marketing right. these spaghetti westerns to the American public wanted to package a, a trilogy. So when we talk about this, we also want to talk about how our audience should also look at these two previous films to sort of pull the whole story together. Sergio Leone was considered the father of spaghetti westerns, although he really wasn't the one who started it. It started years prior, but because it was the first successful movie that came to America, that got all this incredible attention, mm -hmm. and it was a box office hit, coined the term spaghetti western. And you know why they called it a spaghetti western? Yes, because it wasn't filmed in America. This one was actually filmed in Spain, but it had a big Italian cast as well. They went there because it, it had the vistas of the Old West, mm -hmm. and it was inexpensive. And actually, these were filmed in a different language and then dubbed later which is very interesting. You better get that meatball away from me because I want that sucker. You want a meatball? Yeah, but I can't eat it now because I spill everything on my shirt and my shirt will be all crazy. Okay, so it was dubbed afterwards and because of the language issue, the good, bad, and the ugly had a different Italian translation called il buono, il brutto, and il cattivo. Am I saying it right, Mr. Brava, Italian? Bravissima. The Swiss girl bravissima. says it right? Bravissima. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Bravissima. I practiced. When it got translated to the English version, they screwed up the title. You can actually watch the trailer on YouTube, the original 1966 trailer. When the, the translation is the good, the ugly, the bad. So when they showed the actors, Clint Eastwood, the good. Lee Van Cleef was the ugly. Eli Wallach was the bad. And audiences really didn't catch up to it. They f figured it out later, like what was wrong with it. And they right. really didn't know. It was like a little bit of trivia. That's kind of interesting. I want to interject with something with that because they're called Good, Bad, the Ugly. And they consider Clint Eastwood, and we're going to get into him because it made him a star, one of the things. He's the good. Yes. And he has 11 kills in the movie. The bad, Angel Eyes, only has three. And the ugly mm. is Tuco, and he kills six people. So technically, Clint should be reversed, but well, Clint's so that, a smooth guy. And that's one of the themes of spaghetti westerns. You're looking at an Italian production company, Italian director, mm -hmm. writer, looking at American westerns, the history of American West in a different set of eyes. You know, we had spaghetti westerns, but we also had other European countries doing westerns about America, Euro Westerns. They even had Japanese Westerns called Saki Westerns that I found out. Yep. We romanticized when Americans did our own movies. It was always, you know, glory, the tough, you know, cowboy goes after those bad Indians. Keep in mind, we took over their land. Differently, the Italians and the other European countries kind of looked at Westerns as, you know, unnecessarily killing people. We weren't always the good guys. So the good Clint Eastwood, Blondie, he's supposed to be the good guy, but he's really not that good. He's after the money. He does a couple of things that tests his morality. And that was what Spaghetti Westerns, this particular one too, was all about. 
what is really moral? Are you saving people or are you saving them because you're a bounty hunter and you want to get a reward for it like he did with Tuco? In the opening scene when you see Tuco being hung, getting ready to be hanged, all of a sudden the horse leaves and Clint Eastwood shoots him down. Oh. What happened? It's okay. What, so what was that all about? Then you realize, okay, he takes him to the next town. They, they actually take the bounty money and they divvy it up because now that he's escaped, Tuco's worth more money. He and Clint Eastwood are making deals. And again, testing morality because in the American Western, you wouldn't see John Wayne doing that. No. You're, you're really questioning, is he really, is the good really good? And if you take this down to the bare bones and you really think about it, it's like a buddy, non-buddy movie because they rely on each other, but they're both opportunists. Right. And that scene, the first scene where he shoots Tuco and he shoots the rope, and everybody doesn't realize, except for Angel Eyes realizes that Blondie's in on this thing. Right. That scene, actually, the horse ran off, and Eli Wallach was tied with his hands behind his back. And luckily, back then, all those actors knew how to ride horses. He actually stayed on that runaway horse until somebody ran after him and caught him. Right. So that was like, Eli Wallach had a lot of problems in this movie when he we get to the cast. He almost died three times. That was one of them. Yes. The second time was, there's a scene where he, uh, he they get captured by the uh, Union Army, mm -hmm. and there's an underlining story of the Civil War, which was pretty much unheard of. They really didn't want to do that. Matter of fact, we're going to talk about this later. There really wasn't a sellable, you know, Civil War story. But in the Civil War, the Confederates and the Unions, there was really no good, no good guy, no bad guy. Even though historically we, think we consider the Union the good guys and the Confederates the bad guys. Here, again, another lens looking at American history is looking at it different. So when the two opportunists, Clint Eastwood and Eli Wallach, Turco and Blondie, they're using every opportunity available to make money. Well, they get captured, they take taking Tuco away, and he's uh, handcuffed to the Union general. Right. And in the, on the train, they're being transported away. Basically, he's gonna get killed. He has a situation where the, he pushes his captor off the train. Sergio Leone was such a perfectionist that in the scene, there's, he's trying to get away from him. He kills him, and he's got to break away from his handcuffs. So he puts the handcuffs on the rail as another train is passing. Sergio Leone, being such a perfectionist, wanted that in real life. Unknown to Eli Wallach, the train's coming, and they didn't realize that the train has a step down. And as the step down was coming, he didn't, he's putting his head down. Doesn't realize it just missed his head by inches. Had Being he lifted his head, yeah. he would have been beheaded. So, and then there was a third time too. The third time they had bags of gold at the end and they had they were they were made so that they could carry this heavy weight of coins so they had a mixture that they poured to make the bag weaker eli wallach just thought it was a drink and he drank it it was acid and they had filmed that scene in kind of the beginning of the filming it wasn't filmed in consecutive order and the whole film he did with these big sores in his mouth. Mm -hmm. But so did he actually drink it? Because I couldn't get a definitive he drank, answer. He drank it. He drank a sip of it and went, wah! Mm -hmm. And then, you know, spit it out. But acid is enough to, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, one second, done. boink. You know, like piranhas in a tank in the old movies. And then, you know, everybody was just a bone. Let, let, want to go into our costumes oh, and our geez, score? I'm so excited about I know, this movie. I know, you're so excited. I have to calm you down. Okay, well, I am dressed up as, what do you think? Angel Eyes. The bad. And who played Angel Eyes? Lee Van Cleef. Right. And Lee Van Cleef always reminded me of Jack Palance. I don't know why, but they reminded me of each I guess the aquiline features, the high cheekbones, that sinister look. Well, yeah, I'm blondie so because bad. I have blonde hair. I have a white hat on for the good guy. So I'm representing blondie. Uh, and this is a yes. bad guy? This is a good guy. So that's why we're going to review that way, too. Bad and good and bad and good. So should we give our score to just, or what do you want to do? Let's do give our scores that? and then just jump into it. And because, then we'll go yes. absolutely wild. We'll go good, bad, and ugly All right. on this movie. I'm so curious because I have no idea what you're going to do. And I don't know what you're going to do. Yeah. One, two, three, flip. Nine. I want to know why it shied okay. away. Okay. All right, uh, this has to do with age 
and gentrification. First of all, well, I can't I know, see my sign because you, you're too old. No, you can't no, see. No, no, no. I know that's a bowl of spaghetti. It's the first time I've ever seen anything that you drew that I knew what it was. Ah, see, I'm getting yes, to you. Yes, you're getting better. Yes. Have you been taking classes, art classes? I've been taking art classes. Yes. There At you the go. Art Factory, where the dead where giveaway we, was this, where you, we produce our our shows, the Art Factory. Oh, the right? Art Factory, right? But a ten. I mean, I can't say enough good things about this movie, only because I watched it as a teenager. And I just remember my older brother, when he used to pick on me, he used to go, ah, ah, wah, wah, wah. that iconic music phrase, note, whatever you want to right. call it. Um, you know, it's a combination of like a Tarzan yell. Yes. And trumpets with a little wah, wah, yes. wah. And he used to like hit me on right. the head. Like that was the, the warning that he was going to whack me in the head. Well, and when I saw the movie, you know, back then, and then reliving it, watching it again, it just it gave me all that great memories of why I loved it as a kid and even now as an adult loving it even more. Right. The thing about the the soundtrack was but done by Ennio Morricone. I gotta say Morricone. with a, I gotta say it with an Italian accent to say it right Ennio, out of the way. Ennio, Ennio, Ennio Morricone. 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 The big thing was it was played on the radio when we had the radio in the car. It was a huge soundtrack, iconic song. It was on the charts for a year. And also, like you mentioned, the trumpets, and you mentioned the yell in the background. It also was supposed to mimic the sound of coyotes yelling in, yes. the, in the thing. Right. And um, Marconi also did the soundtrack for The Hateful Eight. It was the last soundtrack he did. And The Untouchables, remember that one mm -hmm. with Costner yep. and all that, the baby yep. carriage going down the stairs. He died in 2020. So I want to give a little bit about him before we go into delve into the cast, because this made some people one person in particular, a huge star. But the thing about it is, I saw this when I was little, and compared to the other glossy so before 30... Before or, or after phones? It was the, the two cans with the string, all okay, right? Okay. And it worked very sure. well, as sure. long as you were in within 10 feet of each other. Now, when I first saw it, and you gotta remember, the big studio films were out at this time. This looked a little grainy, it looked a little primitive, mm -hmm. but in watching it again, this has a real essence of the West. It has a wonderful linear plot. Mm -hmm. It has spikes all along the way that are so interesting in a circuitous way that you kind of don't know where, it, where it's going, but you know where it's going. And that's what makes it so... It, I really watched it again this time, and I thought, this is a damn really good picture. But I have to give it a nine because I remember it is primitively filmed and dubbed a little bit. There's a lot of interesting stories about dubbing, but I want to get back into the movie. Okay. Opening scene. Ten minutes, no dialogue. Fantastic. Incredible. It's the scene, and then all of a sudden, this ugly face pops out out of nowhere. These three cowboys are kind of facing each other. You think they're going to... There's going to be a gunsling. There's going to be a shootout. However, they turn into a house, a saloon, something where you're like, okay, where are they going? You hear gunshots. All of a sudden, you see Turco. Tuco. Tuco. I keep doing that wrong. I'm going to do it right now. Tuco jumping through the window, and he's got this, looks like a chicken wing in one hand and a napkin around his neck. And he runs out, and you realize that he shot three people that were after him. And that was the opening right. of the song. Oh! Oh, right. Wah, wah. And, I, and, I, and, I and the to, title. Right. And I have to say to people watching, mm -hmm. watch a scene and take the music out of it and see how flat it is and how music can drive something so beautifully and create it a classic. And, and this is considered, when it first came out, the critics didn't consider it a classic mm -hmm. because it was a new primitive thing. It was gritty. It was dirty. It was all that stuff. Now you look at it and you go, wow, how authentic it is. But the, Roger Ebert, who criticized it, recanted and then said later on, I, this is I know an he criticized it, I didn't know he recanted it. In, yeah, he did. He said this is an incredible seminal film. And I use the word seminal a lot because that is what makes a classic. Though the most iconic thing is Clint Eastwood. He's Blondie and he's also the man with no name. And he goes through all the trilogy. It set the standard for him as, number one, he's a gorgeous guy. Mm. And also very his, handsome and very steely, never shows emotion. Y you know, you want him with you because he's the type of guy who could take on any situation. 
even when he was being tortured and he was in the desert and he didn't have water and everything, Eli Wallach was doing terrible things, he still kept his reserve. He never cried. He never was anything. You know, it's set the standard for Dirty Harry for him. Right. He, he just went right through. Clint's always been a tough guy. Even in Grand Torino at the end when he was an old guy, he's playing the tough guy, you know? Do you like some of my nuts? No, I'm no. I, I don't want. Nuts, right? I don't want your nuts. Oh, okay. Sergio Leone. He, he also directed Once Upon a Time in America, which is like I think that's like one of your Italian type films too. Uh, um, my Once Italian upon type film. Yeah. Once oh, upon a time Sophia in Lorraine the West. Because that's my Italian type film. And a fistful film. of dollars, but he only directed four films. That's it. It's interesting because there was a reviewer that mentioned that that they wished, and he died young. Yeah. He was Sixty, I believe. Yeah. Which. What, to us, when we were little, that seemed real old, but now it seems yeah, like, it's what like, a oh my youngster, God. <laughs> like, child diapers. Pocket is ticking. <laughs> um, there was one reviewer that wished that he was alive to do more films, yeah. that he didn't do enough, because he did a film when he wanted to. Well, when it, when yeah, it's like a visionary. When you movie, look at that so. now, mm -hmm. I was so impressed with this movie when I watched it. And, uh, you know, d nine with a bullet, I'm telling you, because it's really a great, great, you know, Western, that's like a standard right. of the of the genre, like 100%. Clint Eastwood, Sergio Leone, they've done, they did a couple films before that. Right. As I mentioned before, Fistful of Dollars, A Few Dollars More. He wasn't sure, Clint Eastwood, wasn't sure about doing this film. He kind of like, you know, had enough with Sergio Leone. Sergio was a perfectionist. He would do multiple takes. And he was getting other roles, like play Misty for me and things like that. I don't know if Misty was before this or after, but you know, yeah. And I guess, in Clint Eastwood's eyes, you know, he was starting to make a name for himself. Yep. They, Sergio Leone actually flew to the States to try to negotiate with um, Clint Eastwood's agent. In the end, they gave him $250,000, a 10% uh, profits from the movie, and a new Ferrari. He demanded it. Yes. He demanded the Ferrari. Part, part of the deal. He was actually concerned, Clint Eastwood, that when he looked at the script, that more attention was given to Eli Wallach. Quite a bit of dialogue with Eli Wallach and that character. Yeah, but look at the different in their appearance. How could you? Clint Eastwood is one of those actors when he's on the screen, you can't help but look at him. Right. Can I ask you a trivia question? Oh, sure. I'm allowed? No. Because it's Joe's thing. It's my thing. We're doing my thing later. Keep an eye on that, Oh, folks. Jesus. Yeah. What were the two signature things of Clint Eastwood in this film that were iconic? And the what poncho? did they represent? Yes. <laughs> Okay, the poncho. And how which, we got the poncho, remember? The poncho appeared at the end, at the at the gunfight scene, the last scene. Look at you. Um, where he um, donned the poncho, but the poncho also appeared in the prior two films. And again, it's kind of interesting right. because I wish I had a poncho. It was after, today. kind of after the fact that United Artists wanted to package mm. this mm -hmm. "Man with No Name" trilogy, as they called it. They alluded to that poncho as the prequel to the other two previous movies. Right. Um, and what's the second? Let me think. What was the second iconic? The cigar. Yes. <laughs> Joe's right. Joe's right, he really is. And you know what the cigar really represents, if you really think about it? It represents determination and character movement. Because every time he's going to shoot something, he has to make a quick decision. He has to do something that will change it for the audience to say, like, wow, I can't believe he did that. Or, or you know, he's going to shoot something or he's going to be in a fix, which is terrible. He chomps on the cigar, moves mm. it in his mouth, and it represents determination and a movement of the character to go to a different place. And he hated the cigar so much that he said to Sergio Leone, I can't do it anymore. I don't want to smoke. It's disgusting. It's all like in my mouth and crunched up. I'm going to puke if you give me any more cigars. Matter of fact, there was one point that was um, noted in one of the, the historian reviews of this movie. He told Sergio Leone, do this on the first take, otherwise I'm walking off because he couldn't stand that cigar in his right. mouth. Betty Debra Higgins. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Paul of Pew, because questa demonstration da questo film è più importante del solo 
parlano in italiano. Let me get my Just translator on my Google thing. What are you talking about? I am reenacting the, this particular film, the filming of this film. Because well, you really watched this you thing and yes. memorized it now? So this is a great example of the dubbing. It was criticized, but then also recognized yes. as something that many European filmmakers, particular Italians would do. One of the reasons was that as World War II ended, you know, Benito Mussolini, the dictator at the time, controlled the film industry to his oh, message. Yes. I did matter, not know that. Matter of fact, Sergio, Sergio Leone's father was a filmmaker and uh, Benito Mussolini, the dictator at the time, prior to the Second World War, okay. wanted his father to make a film about something he wrote before mm -hmm. he was dictator. And Leone's father said, no, I don't want to do, sorry. Well, when he became dictator, he actually banned Leone's father from doing films. Wow. He, he and his mother, Sergio's mother and father, tried to shy him away from doing films. But because it was just so ingrained in him, he ended up being a filmmaker. The dubbing was, was a part of the surplus war items, equipment. They had these old film cameras and they couldn't do sound because of the loud noise these cameras were making. They were the spillovers from the silent era that they were reusing oh, for sound God, films. Oh my God, that's fascinating. They also found that it was cheaper, mm -hmm. typical Italians, to hire people that maybe didn't speak the same language and to later dub them. There's a great review on YouTube done by uh, the Unforgiven channel. They talk about the masterpiece in storytelling, the wide shots of the landscape, but then mm -hmm. the close-up shots of the face. Classic example is the last scene, the gunshot in the cemetery in Sad Hill, where you have the three characters you know, facing each other. Can I say something about that? It. This yeah. I forgot about this, and this is so important. It was a Mexican standoff. That's what a Mexican standoff is called. And when there's three gunmen, it's called a truel. And one of the directors who loves the truel is Quentin Tarantino. And he uses it in his films, and Glorious Bastards has a truel, Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction. And he loves it. And Tarantino loves anti-hero films. But and in a, one thing I love about it is it its ending was classic. Like Clint rides away, and then you see him for such a long shot, and then he turns around and comes back, and actually kind of helps Tuco in a way, but not letting him go enough that he can retaliate. Right. And it makes you think: Are they going to continue together? Are they going to get together again? It leaves a question mark. I thought that was great. Yeah, it was incredible. That's what makes it a classic. It's, it, was, it was so many things to draw the audience in, to make the audience a part of the movie, to bring in the elements of cinematography, of music, of just a great way of storytelling. And I even think young people will hear that song now and know. I mean, it's been used on TV commercials. It's been used so it many never times. left the consciousness of America. That's mm -hmm. one thing. It's remembered and remembered. One trivia. Joe's okay. thing because she did all of my trivia. Well, I had him. What can I tell well, you? Well, there's one I more. Let me research a film. True or false? Yeah. Are you ready for Joe's thing? Yeah. Okay. Orson Welles warned Sergio Leone. Orson Welles, as we know, is a great storyteller, filmmaker, blah, blah, blah. Warned Sergio Leone not to make this movie on the grounds that Americans don't like Westerns made out of the U.S. True or false? False. You're right. He said they don't like Civil War movies because they were box office poison. Right. Proved him wrong. All right, here's the watch list. Here we go. First of all, the Dollars Trilogy, A Fistful of Dollars from 1964, for a few dollars more, 1965, and then, of course, Good, Bad, and the Ugly. The Wild Bunch, 1969. Talk about changing, uh, talk about changing film in America into violence. People never saw anything like this before. Sam Peckinpah did it. It has Bill Holden and Ernest Borgnine, a seminal film with extreme violence that shocked audiences and is a groundbreaking film that changed Westerns forever. Django, all right? I'm talking about the old Django for 1966. It's about a coffin dragging, gun I hope you're having a good uh, dinner. I'm loving a the spaghetti. A coffin dragging gunslinger and a prostitute become embroiled in a bitter feud between Southern racists and Mexican revolutionaries, and Franco Nero was in that, 
who was in Camelot. He was in love with Vanessa Redgrave forever. He actually coached Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood went and stayed with him and said, I want to talk to you after Django. Tell me everything you did. So he coached Clint. And then Django Unchanged. Let's give Tarantino a nod. From 2012, written and directed by Quentin Tarantino. It's a dark comedy about a bounty hunter named King Schultz, played by Christoph Waltz, not one of my favorites, who seeks out a slave named Django. Jamie Foxx because he needs to find some men he's been searching for. And I could have given you 10, <laughs> but that's it because they don't want me to go any more than four or five. So that's it for my watch list. Well, Deb, this was a lot of fun. I'm holding to my 10. You should change yours to a 10. You're a nine, one shy. Well, yeah, okay. I'll change it to him, but I don't want him to think I vacillate. You All know, right. I want him All to right. think I'm All tough. All right, don't vacillate. I'll give you Vaseline. You can vacillate. All right, so are we done here, Joe? So, Debbie, what are we doing next time? Because I'm ready for more movies. Joe, you never know where we're going until we go there.